most of you are born at a time when India did not face any major food security crisis. But when I was at your age, think about weddings where no wheat chapati was allowed. Think about no naans, only potatoes can be served. And a ship was leaving from US every 15 minutes to feed India. And suddenly the ship stopped and there was a panic in India that millions will starve more than what had happened in China during the Great Leap Forward. 30 million people had starved, died in China because of starvation uh, between 1958 to 61. And India, I'm talking of 1965 and 66, there was a back-to-back -back drought like you had in 14 and 15. Those were the times. Good thing is, bad times give you good policies. Because you are in a crisis, you can't afford to doze off, and therefore some major policy decisions are taken. And that was the time a decision was taken to import high-yielding varieties of dwarf wheat, 18,000 tons from Mexico. Lerma Rojo and Sonora 65, these were the two varieties which were imported, and they were distributed in Punjab, Haryana, Belt, Western UP. And within four years, first crop that came in 67, in Punjab, there was literally a burst of grain. And the Food Corporation of India, which procured that, didn't have a place to store it. So the schools had to be closed down, and the classrooms became the first go-downs of FCI in 1967. And within four years, by 71, the country was talking of self-sufficiency in food grains, and we don't need PL 480 from the US, and all that history of so-called uh, looming starvation in 65, 66, uh, that was made a history by one big decision that was taken. This I will call a creative disruption of technology which was imported from outside, which later on was called as the Green Revolution of India. Impact of that over years, if you look at, three years between 12, 13, and 14, think about what happened to cereals in India. India exported 60 million tons of cereals from this country, six zero on an average 20 million tons each year. A country which was starving through technology, 12, 13, 14, India, largest exporter of rice in the world and a significant exporter of wheat and corn. This is what technology can do. So this is the first and one of the biggest creative destruction or creative uh, Disruption, he said. Actually, Schumpeter called it creative destruction, but uh, uh, he said, no, no, we don't want to call it creative uh, destruction. It is creative disruption. Okay, fine. <coughs> so this is what technology can do. I'm not sure how many of you know what happened in 70s on the milk front. I used to stand in the queue for two hours, three hours in Delhi to get two liters of milk which was literally rationed. And then the operation flood came, and the milkman of India, Dr. Kurian, how he turned around. Think about a country which in 1951 was producing 17 million tons of milk, one seven. And US was producing at that time 53 million tons of milk. Today, US is at 91, 92 million tons of milk, and where is India? Any guess from you? 160 million tons of milk produced by small farmers. By small farmers with two cows or two buffaloes or four buffaloes. This is the biggest wonder, the creative disruption. And this is a model that we are selling to the world that even small holders, it is not the big business, it's just the backyard. 
housewife who is doing all 10 things and she is also milking the cow and feeding the cow and getting business out of that. That's why many a times uh, our women goddesses are shown with six hands or uh, four hands because they can do all multi-purpose jobs at a time. Women employment in dairy sector is about 70% plus. So it's a wonder by the ladies in the milk sector and today India is the largest producer of milk in the world. Last 15 years what has happened? From food to fiber, 26th of March 2002, the Vajpayee government took a major decision and there was a big debate in the parliament as we had the debate in 65, 66 to import those seeds of green revolution. But this time it was not the green revolution, it was the gene revolution. The GM technology was being brought in the country in the cotton sector. And the technology in 2002, India was marginally importing or marginally surplus sometimes, more or less self-sufficient in cotton. But there was a big problem that farmers were facing at that time. A lot of suicides took place because there was a pest attack on cotton. Cotton is something which attracts a lot of pests. When this technology was brought in, there was a big debate. Oh, GM technology sell out to the big multinationals and so on and so forth. What is the result? 2002 to 2015, if you look at the results, India is either now the largest producer of cotton in the world or second largest, marginally just neck to neck with China and second largest exporter of cotton in the world. We have worked it out how much is the benefit it has given to the country if there was a business as usual scenario where we would have been vis-a-vis -vis with this creative disruption, a new technology how much gain it has brought about. And we worked it out, there's a paper, $54 billion worth, $54 billion worth, 1 billion is 6,700 crores. Multiply that and look at how much. So one big decision of a particular government at a time, how much benefit it can give, and today 95%. 95% of the cotton area in the country is under BT cotton, the GM technology. It has never happened anywhere in the world that within such a span, small holders, big holders, medium holders, everybody adopted the technology. It has not happened in US, it has not happened in Brazil or China or others, but India lapped up the technology. You remember there was a prime minister called Lal Bahadur Shastri, and he gave the slogan, Jai Jawan Jai Kisan. That is when the decision was taken to import high-yielding varieties of seeds. And Jawan, we had a war in 1965, but then the Jai Jawan Jai Kisan was added because of that success the Green Revolution brought in later. Prime Minister Vajpayee, when he introduced this technology, he gave a new slogan. And he added in that Jai Jawan, Jai Kisan, Jai Vigyan. That is, it is the science-based disruptions in agriculture which will conquer hunger and poverty from this land. And one proof of that decision, bold decision, was this, where today India has become the second largest exporter of cotton in the world. So food and fiber, both are taken care of. What I'm trying to take you in this transact walk is from green revolution to gene revolution. Today about 180 million hectares of area in the world is under genetically modified technologies of different crops. But what is the next revolution that is coming in? What is the next disruption that is coming in agriculture that is going to assure us greater food security and also take care of the concerns that are happening right now in India and around the world. In India, although at a macro level we are pretty food secure, there are ample supplies, but still 
whether 20% or 25% or 30%, there is a debate how many people are under below the poverty line and going hungry or not well fed. So there is a question of increasing yields further and cutting down the cost so that prices can come down. I was talking to some students here of organic ventures they are thinking of. Organic is good, but the price is double. How many people at the bottom can afford that? That's a challenge that we have. But what is happening? We may be the biggest exporter of rice in the world. In a way, we are exporting water from this country because one liter of rice means about 5,000 liters of water. Similarly, your sugar right here in Maharashtra, one kilogram of sugar means 2,000 liters of water. And when you are exporting these crops, you are a net exporter of water in a country that is prone to so much of drought and you have seen even drinking water in Maratwara had to be ferried through so-called jalduts or water trains. So the challenge that is coming is how to raise productivity in a sustainable manner which doesn't put pressure on the scarce natural resources. And water is going to be a major, major challenge in the years to come. So how do we do that? There is a talk of from green revolution to gene revolution to brown revolution. And what is that brown revolution that is in the offing and already work is on in the US where three companies have tied together. And they are mapping each square kilometer area in US in terms of their moisture content, the soil characteristics, and so on and so forth. So at a time when a harvester is harvesting the crop, they take a sample of the soil, analyze it right there, send the data on the cloud. It is analyzed, and there is a machinery of a particular company. I don't want to give the names of those companies. That particular company instructs its uh, you know, tractor or uh, seed uh, uh, driller how much seed, how much of uh, fertilizers, of nutrients, of NPK uh, needs to be provided and at what depth of uh, moisture. Literally the machine is an auto mode, autopilot mode, like an aeroplane is flying and landing, the uh, same thing happens in cultivation. This is the precision agriculture, that means wherever you need how much water and how much of nutrients, so the yields of corn in that area are about 11 tons per hectare, compared to in India, 2.5 tons per hectare. So you look at the potential the new technologies can offer in the years to come. Green, gene, and brown, why it is called brown revolution? Because it takes care of Mother Earth, what it exactly needs, not overdose. As your food, if you had more of oil in it, you would be sleeping right here. So question is, how much the soil needs exact balanced diet if the soil gets, and the right moisture and water it gets, it can give you a very high productivity, given the seed is also ready to absorb those types of things. So the seed technology, along with this precision technology, this is what the future of agriculture and taking care of your food security and cutting down the cost, taking care of nature, making it available to the poorest of the poor, that is what the new revolution is going to be. Last, what I would say is what the new government is talking about reaching each and every uh, household through uh, uh, the farming household through uh, uh, fossil bima yojana and flying drones and satellites and doves, what is called the low earth orbits, LEOs, uh, to track the position of each and every field. Uh, digitized plots, they can be tracked, what is the situation of uh, the crop and uh, the compensation can be given uh, to the farmers uh, within two weeks after crop damage assessment of a drought or any hailstorm or it. At present, it is taking more than a year and that's why you hear all uh, suicides and other uh, unfortunate things uh, in the farming community. I think once that is installed, taking care of this uh, new technology and the new 
policy vision, I think uh, suicides can be a history and this country can flourish, both the farmers and they can provide you food security at a lower cost and a more nutritious food. Thank you very much.